Of all the survival strategies nature has invented, there is perhaps none as chilling as the parasite. Most predators kill you. Parasites are different. They move quietly. They slip inside unnoticed. And they don't just feed on your body, they take control of it, rewriting your behavior. Sometimes, they even turn you into something else entirely. And while that sounds like the stuff of horror movies, it's not fiction. It's biology. Today, we still see hints of it. There's the brain parasite Toxoplasma gondii, which infects rodents and removes their fear of cats, effectively delivering them to their predators. There's the infamous Ophiocordyceps fungus, which climbs inside ants and forces them to crawl to high places before sprouting a stalk from their head. Even rabies, a virus, rewires the brain with aggression to spread itself further. But if you think this is creepy now, you should have seen what was happening tens of millions of years ago. Because back then, there was a parasite that didn't just infect mammals. It turned them into zombies. To understand how it happened, you have to go back to the world just after the dinosaurs. It's the Paleocene, roughly 60 million years ago. The Earth is still healing from the asteroid impact that wiped out the great reptiles. Mammals, once tiny, hidden creatures, are beginning to spread. Some are evolving into small predators, like early creodonts. Others are herbivores, scampering insectivores, or primitive ancestors of modern hoofed animals. The forests are thick, humid, and full of life, trying to reclaim what the dinosaurs left behind. On the surface, it looks peaceful, but beneath that calm, there's something far more insidious spreading through the ecosystem. A microscopic invader, invisible, patient, waiting for its moment. It starts small. Maybe it contaminates a pool of stagnant water, or clings to a piece of half-eaten fruit. An unsuspecting mammal, let's say a little insectivore, no bigger than a shrew, wanders by, takes a drink, and swallows it. And that's all it takes. Inside its body, the parasite begins its journey. It doesn't kill its host, at least not right away. It moves through the bloodstream like a shadow, slipping past the immune defenses. It finds its way to the brain. And that's where the real horror begins. Because this isn't just an infection, it's a hijacking. The parasite targets specific regions of the brain, parts that control fear, movement, and instinct. It doesn't erase the brain completely. It leaves the host alive and aware, but it makes subtle changes, rewiring signals, shutting down the reflexes that keep an animal safe. Suddenly, the infected mammal stops hiding in the dense underbrush. It wanders into the open in broad daylight. It stops avoiding the sense of predators. In fact, it seeks them out. To any predator watching, it's as if the prey is volunteering. This wasn't random cruelty, it was strategy. The parasite's life cycle needed two hosts. First, it infected small prey mammals, but it couldn't complete its reproduction there. To finish the cycle, it had to be eaten by a larger carnivore. Only in the gut of a predator could it reproduce and spread its eggs back into the environment, ready to infect the next victim. So how do you guarantee your host gets eaten? You simply remove its fear. Imagine you're an early creodont, a small, wolf-like predator prowling the Paleocene forest. You're used to stalking and chasing prey. It's hard work, but suddenly, a perfect healthy mammal steps into the open. It doesn't run. It doesn't freeze. It just stares at you, trembling but not moving. And you don't even have to try. You pounce. Inside the prey's brain, the parasite has already won. It's passed itself to the predator, where it will finish its dark little mission. And the predator? It doesn't know it's now infected too. Over time, this parasite spread silently through entire ecosystems. It didn't just manipulate one species, it could infect dozens. Herbivores, insectivores, even small primates, anything that drank contaminated water or nibbled contaminated food could become a puppet. And wherever it spread, it made predators more successful. Not because the hunters were better, but because their prey stopped resisting. This wasn't just a parasite. It was an invisible force reshaping the entire predator-prey balance. And once you understand how it worked, you start to see how terrifyingly effective it was. It's even possible that in some local areas, it created population crashes. Think about it. If too many prey animals were infected, they'd wander into the open and be eaten en masse. Entire populations could have collapsed, leaving predators without food once the easy pickings were gone. Then the parasite, having burned through its hosts, would vanish too. It wasn't just zombifying animals. It was creating boom and bust cycles across ancient forests. And here's the part that makes your skin crawl. This wasn't some alien organism that disappeared with the dinosaurs. Variations of it are still here. Modern Toxoplasma does the same thing to rodents today, making them lose their fear of cats so they get eaten. Cats then spread the parasite back into the environment. It's estimated that one-third of all humans carry Toxoplasma in their brains right now. It doesn't make us walk toward lions, but in the past, when ancient mammals were smaller, slower, and more vulnerable, 
It absolutely could. So what did this actually mean for the mammals of the Paleocene? Well, in the short term, it made life a nightmare for the infected. They were walking targets, their instincts completely compromised. Predators didn't even have to hunt, they simply waited. And the parasite thrived because it didn't care about individuals, it only cared about getting from one host to the next. But in the long term, it may have shaped evolution itself. Think about it. If a parasite constantly targets the most timid, the ones who stay hidden the longest, those animals survive and pass on their cautious genes. Meanwhile, the bold, or in this case, the brainwashed, get eaten. Over many generations, prey animals become more suspicious, more skittish, their senses sharper than before. On the other side, predators that relied too much on infected, easy prey may have become lazy, less skilled hunters. When the parasites spread waned and the easy meals disappeared, those predators would have struggled. So in a strange way, this parasite was acting as an invisible evolutionary sculptor, rewarding paranoia in prey, punishing dependence in predators, and quietly shaping the behavior of entire species. And yet, it never left a fossil. It left no bones, no shells, just a silent record in the way animals lived and died. It's also possible that parasites like this helped drive the diversification of mammalian immune systems. Because think about what a brain infection forces an animal to do. Either it develops better defenses, immune systems that can recognize and block the invader, or it loses the evolutionary lottery. Over millions of years, these invisible battles between parasite and host pushed mammals to evolve more complex immune responses. In a way, you could argue that without ancient parasites, mammals, including us, wouldn't be as resilient as we are now. So even in their horror, parasites were forcing life forward. But while the Paleocene parasite that zombified mammals has long vanished, its modern descendants are everywhere. Take Toxoplasma gondii. Today, it infects rodents and rewires their brains so they stop fearing cats. In fact, they're drawn to the smell of cat urine, which, if you're a mouse, is basically suicide. But for the parasite, it's genius. Cats are its final host, the place where it can reproduce. And here's the disturbing part. Humans can be infected with Toxoplasma too. It's estimated that up to one-third of the global population is carrying it in their brains right now. In people, it doesn't make you walk into a lion's mouth, but some studies suggest it subtly affects human behavior, linked to increased risk-taking, slower reaction times, even higher chances of car accidents. Some scientists even speculate it might influence personality traits over time. So when we talk about a parasite turning mammals into zombies millions of years ago, it's not just ancient history, it's still happening, just in quieter, subtler ways. And Toxoplasma is just one example. There's Ophiocordyceps, the infamous zombie fungus that infects ants, making them climb plants before bursting from their bodies to spread spores. There's the rabies virus, which makes mammals hyper-aggressive and driven to bite others, spreading the infection. Even tiny parasitoid wasps inject their eggs into caterpillars and hijack their nervous system, forcing them to protect the larvae that will eventually eat them alive. Nature is full of organisms that use control as a weapon. The Paleocene parasite that turned early mammals into walking sacrifices was just a larger scale, ecosystem-wide version of the same trick. But here's what makes it so unnerving. Parasites don't just feed on bodies, they feed on behavior. They don't need claws or fangs or brute strength. They simply reach inside the mind, flip a few switches, and suddenly an animal is working for them without even knowing it. A mammal thinks it's making its own choices, but really, it's being guided toward its own death. It's biological mind control. And millions of years ago, it spread through ancient forests and grasslands like a ghost. Mammals wandering out in the open, predators with full bellies, ecosystems tilted in favor of an organism you couldn't even see. The scary truth? It shows how fragile free will really is. We like to think of behavior as something deliberate, controlled, conscious, but if a microscopic parasite can rewire an animal's brain so completely, how much of what we do is really our own? Even today, scientists debate how many subtle nudges in human behavior might be caused by parasites we don't even notice. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's everything. And if that makes you uncomfortable, it should. Because what happened to those ancient mammals wasn't some freak accident of evolution. It was a survival strategy, one so effective that it's still with us today. So the next time you hear the word zombie, don't just think of Hollywood. Think of a tiny marsupial wandering out into the open 60 million years ago. Think of its heart racing as it walked toward the scent of a predator. Think of the parasite inside, silently pulling the strings. This wasn't fiction, it was nature. And in the Paleocene, nature didn't just kill mammals, it made them walk willingly to their deaths.